All right, so it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all to the first seminar of the O2023 for the SORC seminar series. Uh, today, it's with delight that uh, we welcome the uh, Sheila, uh, Sheila Thieves Lab from UBC. Uh, they'll present some very cool data on uh, some of the newest uh, research projects uh, from, from the lab. Uh, so just a couple of reminders uh, and uh, housekeeping. So first of all, I'd like to thank you all for participating. Uh, I would like to thank Acting Motif for supporting our uh, our seminar series and taking care of all the logistics uh, behind the seminar series. Um, and I would like to remind all of you to please use the Q&A button at the very bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to ask questions, okay? Um, so we're gonna start the day with a talk by Rachel Price. Um, Rachel is a fourth year PhD candidate in the Thieves lab. She, she completed her uh, undergraduate degree in biochemistry, biophysics, and molecular biology in uh, uh, Walla Walla, Washington. Uh, she joined the Thieves lab in 2019, and the current project examines the transcription factor activity during mitosis in mouse embryonic stem cells. And she is approaching this uh, theme by using a combination of genomics, single molecule life, uh, life cell imaging, and gene editing. This project was awarded the Dragon's Den Award from the BC Regenerative Medicine Network in 2021. So congratulations, Rachel. And uh, we're really looking forward to your talk. All right. Thank you so much for that introduction. I'm happy to be here. So today we are beginning with the stem cell, uh, which is the system that we use in the Tevis lab. So every time a stem cell divides, it can essentially go down one of two paths. It can either self-renew into more stem cells, or it can differentiate um, if prompted. Stem cells can self-renew pretty much indefinitely in culture, which means that they very faithfully maintain um, their transcriptional programming across many cell divisions. This is especially impressive when we consider just what a drastic process mitosis is. It's accompanied by huge changes in cellular morphology and function. For example, transcription is globally downregulated, uh, chromatin is really tightly condensed and fewer proteins interact with the DNA. Even though these changes disrupt a lot of the regulatory mechanisms that govern the cell's transcriptional programming, stem cells are still able to maintain that transcriptional memory. So the question is, how do they do this? How is transcription faithfully reestablished after mitosis? One mechanism that helps to maintain transcriptional programming is mitotic bookmarking. This is where genes are marked by transcription factors during mitosis to promote rapid reactivation uh, upon mitotic exit. So when bookmarking is lost during mitosis, the reactivation of the target gene can be delayed or inhibited. These interactions between mitotic chromatin and transcription factors are most often identified by two types of methods. The first is chromatin binding assays that avoid formaldehyde fixation. These methods can measure site-specific binding of the transcription factor. Here is just an example of this for SOX2. Um, this is cut and tag data in our mouse embryonic stem cells in asynchronous and mitotic cells. And we can see that SOX2 maintains this mitotic binding um, at the OCT4 enhancer is what our gene track is here. The second set of methods is some kind of live cell imaging. So with this, what we can see is just a very general association or coding of the transcription factor on the DNA, but we can't really tell whether it's binding um, to specific loci in the genome. So we just get a very general view and we call that global association coding. <clears throat> transcription factors demonstrate actually a really wide range of mitotic coding, um, as we can see here. We have SOX2 again, way over on the right, which en enriches the mitotic chromatin very strongly. 
Um, many other transcription factors are very much evicted from the mitotic chromatin on the left. And a lot also are sort of in between. So they associate with some degree to, with the mitotic DNA, um, but not as strongly as perhaps they could. What we don't fully understand is the mechanism behind these mitotic associations. For instance, why do some transcription factors interact with mitotic DNA while others don't? The DNA binding domain, or DBD, um, has been previously implicated in this mechanism. Here we're again looking at SOX2, which is tagged in red, and we have the DNA uh, visualized in green in our images. When we delete the DNA binding domain of SOX2, the protein is evicted from the mitotic chromatin. If we do the opposite and we express the DBD in isolation, it is able to coat the chromatin. But the DNA binding domain doesn't really explain everything. Some transcription factors have very similar DVDs, but they still interact differently with the mitotic DNA. A good example of this is heat shock factors one and two, which is a pair that I'll focus on for the rest of the talk. These factors have about 81% DBD similarity, but HSF1 is evicted from the mitotic chromatin and HSF2 is enriched. So using this pair of transcription factors, we really aimed to further define the principles of transcription factor behavior during mitosis. Today, I'll be going over two of the methods that we used to do this, the first being cut and tag, which is a fixation-free chromatin binding assay, and the second is live cell imaging. Cut and tag, for those who aren't familiar, is a method used to map proteins to chromatin, so it's very similar to ChIP-seq. Antibodies first bind um, your protein of interest, and then those antibodies are bound by a transposase loaded with sequencing adapters. The adapters are then integrated on either side of your protein, and the DNA fragments between them can be amplified and subsequently sequenced. We did cut and tag for the endogenous HSF1 and 2 in interphase and mitosis, and the SOX2 data is also shown here for a positive control. These are genome-wide heat maps, um, and they're centered around all binding sites for each transcription factor. On a global scale, we see really strong binding of SOX2 uh, maintained in mitosis. Binding of HSF2 was also greatly um, maintained or even increased during mitosis. In contrast, binding of HSF1 was really greatly decreased during mitosis. And we can see this at a single gene locus as well on the right, where again, that loss of HSF1 binding in mitosis is really clear. Next, we looked at these factors with live cell imaging. So to do this, each transcription factor was tagged with a halo tag, so we can see it, and then overexpressed in our mouse embryonic stem cells. As expected, SOX2 um, really clearly coats the chromatin. HSF1, in contrast, is clearly evicted from the area of the chromatin. But really unexpectedly, HSF2 is also evicted from the chromatin. And when we quantify this enrichment, um, we can see that HSF1 and 2 are evicted to a very similar level. This was really a kind of a puzzling result for us since HSF2 had such high levels of site-specific binding um, during mitosis with cut and tag. So we thought maybe there is an intrinsic part of the HSF2 protein that prevents it from coding, and we wanted to find out what that was. To narrow down which domains contribute to its exclusion from mitotic DNA, we began truncating HSF2 from the C terminus. Our first truncation includes the DNA binding domain, the NLS, and the HR trimerization domain. The second smaller truncation includes just the DVD um, and the NLS. 
So the DVD HR construct, so this is that first larger truncation, is still clearly evicted from the chromatin. However, once we remove the HR and we're left with just the DVD, we can see that the construct begins to coat. So it, you can't see that clear area of eviction um, anymore. So the HSF2 DVD is able to coat in isolation. Furthermore, it seems like this HR domain is necessary for the exclusion of HSF2. Now, the domain organization of HSF1, our other factor, is very similar to HSF2. They're very similar proteins. So we wondered if we remove the DVD of HSF1 and instead replace it with the DVD of HSF2, will it then be able to induce the coding of HSF1? So we made this chimeric construct here, um, but as you can see from the imaging, it is still clearly evicted. <clears throat> so what it seems like is that the non-DBD domains of HSF1 work to evict the protein um, in a very similar way as to what we see with HSF2. Just to very briefly summarize these findings, um, we find that the non-DBD domains of both HSFs seem to dictate their exclusion from mitotic chromatin. Also, mitotic chromatin coding, as seen with imaging, and site-specific binding, as seen um, with cut and tag, appear to be driven by different mechanisms and are detectable with different methods. This is really exemplified by HSF2, which binds site-specifically, uh, but does not coat the DNA. If you're interested in reading the full story, um, you can scan the QR code here to find our preprint on BioArchive. And with that, I'd like to thank, of course, the lab, particularly our postdoc, Merrick, who worked equally on this project with me, as well as our two co-op students, Iris and Jennifer, who contributed as well. And I would be happy to take a couple questions at this time. Thank you, Rachel. That's a fantastic story. It's a fantastic technique that you're using, right? The single molecule type of... Um tracking in, in life cells is really, really cool. So in general, what's the identity at the amino acid level between the DBD domains of HSF1 and 2? So it's about 81% similarity. I think it's closer to 50% identity. So they are very highly conserved. Highly conserved. And is there any key amino acid you think that is evolutionarily conserved in across species that might be different just between these two uh, these two proteins? That's a good question. I we haven't looked in to that closely yet at the DVD. We're really looking at more broadly just the domains by themselves. So I'm not sure specifically about an amino acid at this point. And another question I had was um, do you know if HSF1 and 2 interact with different partner proteins, and they might explain a little bit uh, different properties of the different proteins? That's a good question. Um, they do actually interact with each other. They can sort of heterotrimerize um, or homotrimerize, you know, with themselves or with each other. As far as other partner proteins, um, I don't know specifically, but they do have distinct functions, even though they can interact with each other. So it's possible that Part of, part of their difference in coding is interaction with other proteins that might promote that, but it's not something we've explored yet. Okay, cool. We have, so one question from Mark Perry in the audience is, um, I thought HSF only activates his shock genes. Why does it bind all along the chromosomes? Yeah, that's a great question. So HSF2 actually has it does have a role in um, development as well. So it's not just heat shock genes. HSF1 is more of the sort of canonical main heat shock factor for you know, cellular stress, but HSF2, there's evidence it does a lot more. Um, but it is interesting um, for sure. It's very interesting that they do more than just heat shock. <laughs> okay. We have, I think we'll give time for just one or two more questions. So one question that I find very interesting is, does the chromatin openness change in the mitotic chromosome at the locus where HSF2 binds? Hmm. As far as specifically for HSF2, that's not an experiment that we've done, but there is other data that shows that 
um, the chromatin accessibility is maintained by mitotic bookmarking. That's been shown for other factors. So it is still, um, that accessibility is maintained by the, the binding of the factor during mitosis. Okay, and very last question. Um, what does coding do regarding biological function of the proteins since they do not contribute to say specific binding? That's a yeah, that's a really great question. Um, as far as we speculate, it could just help to increase the concentration of the protein around the DNA. So that sort of non-specific binding. Um, non-specific binding is also plays a role in like searching target search. So it's sliding along the DNA sliding along the DNA looking for its target. Um, so those are kind of the two the two ways that we think it might be helping with the binding. Amazing. All right. Thank you so much, Rachel. Great talk. All right. Um, and now I'd like to um, switch to uh, Sheila. Uh, Dr. Tips is, is an assistant professor in biochemistry and molecular biology at the University of British Columbia. Uh, she's also a Canada Research Chair Tier 2 in Mechanisms of Gene Regulation. Uh, she received her PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle, uh, where she learned how to apply genomics-based approaches to study nucleosome dynamics uh, in tuning transcription regulation. She then performed did her postdoctoral work at, uh, in Berkeley, uh, where she studied how transcription programs are maintained or regulated uh, during the cell cycle. And she again used genomics and super resolution single molecular imaging to achieve her goals. She started her own group in July 2018 at the University of British Columbia where she combined different techniques that she learned over the years and new, as well as new approaches to studying biological mechanisms um, uh, relating to transcription regulation, chromatin biology, and cell identity. So it's a pleasure to uh, host Sheila today at the, our SORC seminar series. And Sheila, the stage is all yours. Okay, I think I'm sharing now. Okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's a pleasure to uh, present to this um, esteemed group, and I've been really enjoying the CERC seminar series, so I'm really excited to be here. Um, so thank you for the invitation. And um, I would like to say, though, I'd like to start that uh, um, we do our work um, and really live and play also in a beautiful land here in UBC, and it's located in the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. So as uh, you might have gleaned from Rachel's talk, um, we study transcription broadly, um, of many aspects of transcription. But why do we study transcription? For me, the main motivation really is how a single genome can give rise to a whole organism with all the different cell types, all functioning very distinctly, but all together. And this is really done um, through transcription regulation. And in fact, many errors in transcription are major causes of diseases. So this is really a prime motivation for our lab. As Rachel mentioned, um, our research in transcription regulation uh, is um, using mouse embryonic stem cells for its two primary uh, um, characteristics. One is the ability to self-maintain uh, over time, which as you just saw a snippet of the research on transcriptional memory, um, but the other is the ability to change its uh, transcription program over time, what we call transcriptional plasticity. And we're hoping we can show you uh, projects on this side uh, in the future. And really um, at the heart of these uh, two uh, arms is the very core mechanisms of transcription regulation. And so our lab also studies um, basic mechanisms. Um, and so this is kind of, um, uh, shown here, where I'm um, showing you uh, members of the lab that are working on the memory. So both Rachel and Merrick, uh, uh, you saw the project on. We're going to talk about the mechanisms of transcription regulation being led by James and Thomas in the lab. We also have a new direction on evolution of transcription mechanisms uh, being led uh, by Hazel, a uh, new grad student, Henry, and also collaboration with James. But I'm going to focus um, primarily uh, sort of throughout the next few uh, 20 minutes or so on the mechanisms of transcription regulation. Okay, so transcription is very complex. Um, it starts out with the assembly of the pre-initiation complex. And really uh, the key player in this is TF2D 
which also includes the Tata binding protein called TBP. So they bind uh, about 30 base pairs upstream of the transcription start site. Usually, well, not usually, but some genes have the Tata box there. It induces a band in the DNA, which then recruits the general transcription factor TF2A, TF2B, which then triggers the recruitment of RNA polymerase II, along with the GTFs TF2E and TF2I, TF2F, which then allows for the transcription bubble to form, leading to the recruitment of TF2H and then uh, elongation. So it's a massive complex that has to be assembled in order for transcription to occur. As I mentioned earlier, at the heart of this um, initiation complex is this uh, transcription factor TBP. As you can see, it's the, it has a satellite shaped structure that bends the DNA. Um, and TBP is um, a really interesting protein to study because it doesn't only it's not only involved in pol 2 transcription, but it's also involved in pol 1 and pol 3. So as you can see in the conserved crystal structures here, the TBP is um, at the center of the DNA kinks for each of the three RNA polymerase enzymes. So TBP is at the heart of all three structures. And TBP is really important for transcription, at least has been shown um, for decades in vitro transcription. Um, this is a paper in 1989 by Steve Hahn showing that when you don't have TBP in in vitro extracts, um, it doesn't produce um, transcription and it only does so when you add TBP. More recently, this has been shown in vivo also where um, if you anchor away, if you remove TBP from the cells, you get a massive decrease in pol 2 occupancy at all genes, including this one specific locus that they were looking at. So TBP is really central. However, there's some, um, there's some evidence that, it, that, that seems to be the exception. So for example, in 2002, uh, Marsha Navatal showed this in uh, mouse embryos where they had a conditional knockout, a full knockout of TBP, and the embryos develop up to a certain stage. So knockout of TBP is fully lethal. And after about 40 cell stage, the embryos die. But at this point, they can still isolate embryos that are alive, where they show that there is no TBP in the knockout compared to the wild type. But they still showed incorporation of new RNA. So in this case, uh, shown by BRRNA staining. And so uh, what happens to TB? What really is the role of TBP in transcription? To get at this question, we used a new technique, well, new back then, uh, but we endogenously knocked in the oxidant-inducible digron, in, shown here in this cartoon, into the TBP locus. So all of our mouse embryonic stem cells have the AID TBP uh, knock infusion. This allows us to add the drug IAA, which induces a rapid degradation of TBP. So this, uh, um, so this system allows us to probe for a mechanistic um, function of TBP in a rapid way, because we can do this within six hours. So you can see here in the homozygous knock-in that um, upon six hours of depletion or six hours of addition of the drug, we see about 90 to 95% depletion of TBP compared to wild type where it's not affected, obviously. Okay, so from this, we ask what happens to uh, pol 2 transcription? Okay, we first started to do this uh, using two orthogonal methods. First, we looked at pol 2 binding profile using cut and tag, which Rachel had already introduced. Um, second, we looked at the activity of the RNA polymerase II using nascent RNA profiling with NetSeq. I'm not going to go through the details of NetSeq, but just know that it um, profiles the last nucleotide that the RNA polymerase II has added. And so this allows us to really look at um, both binding and activity uh, when TBP is gone or mostly gone. Okay, so what does it look like? Here we show um, gene tracks for two genes. Uh, beta-actin and GAP-DH, where on the top here, 
is TBP with and without depletion. And you can see a massive decrease in TBP occupancy at the promoters of these two genes. The next gene tracks are POL2 and NetSeq, both in control and TBP depleted conditions. And what I hope you can see is that um, POL2 binding or the activity is largely unaffected by TBP depletion. In fact, we can look at this globally. So you can see here again is our um, TBP cut and tag where we show um, massive decrease in TBP occupancy upon depletion. So we believe that our assay is working correctly. But instead of a massive decrease in POL2 binding, we see largely no effect in POL2 occupancy or in the nascent RNA um, activity. So this, these are the global heat maps, but we can look at this on a gene-by-gene -gene basis. So here we plotted um, each gene as a, um, as a data point, um, either uh, on the y-axis, it's the average log uh, of the POL2 occupancy or the NetSeq signal in each gene. And then on the y-axis is the log fold change when TB compared to, for control compared to TBP depleted. And so if there is no change, they all lie on the horizontal, which means the log fold change is zero right here. So as you can see, for the most the majority of the genes, 99.9% .9 of them are all lying on the horizontal with maybe a few exceptions here, um, about 20 to 30 genes in the POL2 occupancy side and you know a handful of them on the NetSeq side. So what we can say is that global POL2 transcription is largely unaffected by TBP depletion. You might be going around and asking, well, is there something wrong with our MAID TBP system? And is this just like a negative result? Well, we thought about that. And so we asked, well, what happens to pol 3 transcription? So TBP is supposed to be important for all three, right? So here are tRNA genes transcribed by pol 3 And then we also profiled pol 3 and looked at the NetSeq signal at these genes. And what you can see is that TBP is, is still gone after TBP depletion, but now POL3 occupancy is massively decreased on tRNA genes. The same is true with the NetSeq signal. And this is quantified globally for all tRNA genes, showing massive decrease in TBP occupancy after depletion and massive decrease in POL3 occupancy after TBP depletion. And so from here, we can say that um, we can use this POL3 data to show we as a positive control that our system is working as expected. And most importantly, the contrast to its effect on POL2 transcription is really striking, meaning that POL2 should also be globally um, downregulated, but the fact that it's not is really surprising. Okay, after that, we asked, what could be the mechanism for this TBP-independent POL2 transcription? We thought of three potential mechanisms, and the audience might be able to help us with thinking of other mechanisms. But so far, these are the three we tested. The first is that TBP might not be required for ongoing transcription, meaning that once transcription is started, it's kind of primed and then it just kind of keeps going and TBP is no longer needed there. And that as a corollary to that, that would mean that TBP would only be required for going from silent to active uh, transcription. So that's the first one we thought of. The next, the second uh, potential mechanism we thought of is that TBP has um, evolved to have paralogs so very uh, highly similar um, proteins to TBP. And perhaps these paralogs could be replacing TBP when TBP is depleted. So that's the second one. The third is that per perhaps um, TF2D, which is composed of TBP and uh, TBP associated factors, perhaps TBP can function without TBP. Um, and so we tried to explore all three of these um, potential mechanisms. And I, I always like to do this uh, in person, but we can't do it here. I usually ask, which one do you think it is? Um, so maybe take a moment 
and think which one you want it to be. And then we'll go through um, the data for each of them. Okay, so presumably you've voted for your favorite mechanism. So let's go start with the first one. So we thought of a way of how to test this, the first one, by inducing transcription. And so we used um, the heat shock response as a model for transcription induction. And very briefly, heat shock is a, a highly conserved uh, stress response, which leads to the activation of heat shock protein genes through the binding of the heat shock factors, which you heard about from Rachel earlier. This leads to um, activation of target genes, but also global downregulation of transcription. Okay, so we use this system um, to ask if TBP is needed to induce heat shock um, and new transcription. And our paradigm here is we induce TBP depletion for six, six hours or under control conditions. And then we subjected um, both conditions to 30 minutes of heat shock. And then we assay um, for TBP profiling, whole tube profiling, and net seek profiling. And here are two heat shock related genes. And you can see uh, on the first line here on the gene tracks is the control conditions. The second is the heat shock um, condition. And then the third is the heat shock with TBP depletion. So you can really see in the, the TBP uh, cut and tag that he, even up, uh, upon heat shock with TBP depletion, um, most of TBP is gone. With POL2, you can see that there's largely no binding during control, but then high binding upon heat shock. And this high binding is even maintained when TBP is depleted, or it occurs even when TBP is depleted. And the same is true with the NetSeq signal here. We can quantify this uh, in the same way that I showed you earlier in the gene by gene basis, where each dot here is a gene. And here we're comparing heat shock versus control. And you can see all the genes that are upregulated by heat shock response in red, and all the genes that are downregulated in blue. Now, when we compare heat shock with TBP depletion versus the heat shock only, you can see that there's absolutely no significant differences um, in uh, the activation profile, meaning that the genes that are activated upon heat shock are still activated even when TBP is depleted. Okay, so unfortunately, that means that the first mechanism is not the case. So TBP, we believe, is not required also for inducing transcription. Okay, so then we looked at the second one, TBP paralogs. So TBP um, has evolved uh, through gene du duplication throughout evolution, uh, at least three distinct paralogs. So there's TBP, TBPL1, TBP-like one, which encodes for the TRF1 protein, and TBPL2, which encodes for the TRF2 protein. Um, these paralogs are um, highly similar to TBP, at the very least in their highly conserved DNA binding domain. The N-terminal region is less, much less conserved, but here uh, the DNA binding domain, of course, is the one that's responsible for DNA binding. Now, mouse embryonic stem cells are only expressing TRF2. TRF1 is not expressed. And so we focused on TRF2. And what we did is essentially knock out TRF2 in the cell line that has the AID TBP background. And these are just confirmation of two different uh, knockout clones where we no longer see uh, TRF2 protein. But at the end of the day, we profiled cut and tag in TRF2 knockout with or without TBP depletion. And even though we see a little bit more changes in POL2 transcription, um, there isn't that global decrease in transcription that we would expect if TRF2 is functionally redundant to TBP. So this suggests that TRF2 um, does not replace TBP when 
TBP is depleted. So it's not the second one, right? Okay, so down to the last one. Could TF2D be functioning without TBP? So when we first um, tried to tackle this question, we asked, how does TBP uh, form uh, without, uh, uh, can the TF2D form without TBP? So again, here's the cartoon version, but really the crystal structure is much, much nicer. You can see that TBP is part of the TF2D complex. Um, and this, again, uh, I should clarify that this crystal structure, or sorry, cryo-EM structure is really just for the TF2D complex. So just this uh, as part of the full PIC. You can see TF2D is here binding one, side, one end of the DNA uh, and that all the, TF, uh, the um, TBP associated factors or TAFs are forming this kind of um, U-shaped anchor that allows for also um, a secondary uh, DNA binding contact on the other end. So there are about 13 to 14 TAFs associated with TBP and TF2D. Um, and so what we thought we could do is um, pull down with TAF4 in purple here and do um, IPMS with or without TBP. So we did that. Um, and this is our um, just to control showing that the TAF4 is there when, even when TBP is depleted. TBP is mostly gone. Also, this is our control that we are pulling down TAF4 and we can detect TBP even when um, TBP is depleted. So you can see our IP here, which now we have um, really low levels of TBP. Okay, so what does the IPMS um, give us? So what we're showing here are the log fold enrichment over IgG for control or TBP depleted conditions for each of the 13 uh, TAF subunits um, of the TF2D complex. Um, in blue is the control, in red is the TBP depleted. And what I hope you can um, appreciate is that even when TBP is depleted, we see largely no change in each of the subunits of the TAF, uh, the TF2D complex. So this tells us that the TF2D complex can form even when TB TBP is absent or at least largely depleted. Okay, so next we asked, could um, this TF2D complex um, still bind to TBP or to the DNA even without TBP? And so we used cut and tag again, and we profiled for TAF4 and TAF1, which is um, the white uh, subunit here um, in, the, in this um, cryo-EM structure. Um, we profiled them under control conditions and TBP depleted conditions. Um, and so on the top here is the global average. And what you can see on the bottom here is the heat, uh, is the heat map um, for control versus um, TBP depleted um, conditions. And what we found is that there might be some differences in the levels, uh, but that both TAF1 and TAF4 uh, largely um, bind to DNA even when TBP is depleted. So in the case of TAF4, this binding is decreased by about 50% or so, um, whereas in TAF1, it's, it's slightly increased uh, when TBP is depleted, which is curious. But regardless of these differences, um, at least um, as shown by these two subunits, um, the TF2D complex uh, at least can associate with, with the DNA, even when TBP is depleted. Which really leads us to um, uh, potentially um, the mechanism that it's actually the TF2D complex is robust enough to allow for TBP to be depleted and yet still form and still bind to DNA to promote um, pol 2 transcription. So what I've shown you today is that global TBP or global pol 2 transcription is mostly unaffected by TBP depletion. TBP is required for pol 3 transcription. 
which really um, is nicely contrasting to our poll 2 result. And that gene induction uh, of the poll 2 genes at the heat shock genes does not require TBP. Um, TBP is not required uh, for poll 2 activation of differentiation genes. This is something I didn't show, but it was an orthogonal way of inducing transcription. And that the TBP paralog TRF2 does not functionally replace TBP, but instead the TF2D complex forms and can bind to promoters uh, even when TBP is depleted. So with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, the whole lab, um, which is uh, most of us here uh, with the addition of Henry here. Um, our collaborators and colleagues, uh, especially Philip, Philip Lang and Anuli Azuzi for the IPMS um, experiments, um, our colleagues in the molecular epigenetics group here at UBC, and our funding sources. So I will leave it at that. Might be a bit early and fast. <laughs> Sorry. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Sheila. That's a very interesting story, very interesting mechanism. Um, we have lots of questions from the audience, so I'm going to get started asking them right away. Um, so the first question is, how long can mouse embryonic stem cells survive without TBP? Uh, yes, they do not. <laughs> they do not survive more than 24 hours. So by 24 hours, we see like about 50 to 60% of the cells are dead. By 48 hours, uh, 90 to 95% are dead. Um, and so they really don't survive uh, TBP depletion for very long, which is why the oxygen inducible degron and the rapid depletion is really important to um, understand these um, the, the, the rapid mechanisms that we're looking at. Okay. And thank you. And then just to clarify the, the experimental kind of setup for these experiments, um, did you swap the endogenous TBP gene with the deep TBP degro gene, uh, or did you still have basal expression of the endogenous TBP in the cells? Um, it was a, a CRISPR knock-in, so okay. it's a homozygous knock-in. So there is no uh, no endogenous, no no wild type protein. So all the molecules have the the degron. Okay, and the cells with the degron, the degron tag TBP, did it have any uh, phenotypic uh, changes compared to the parental cell lines? Um, we checked for these. Um, we, uh, it doesn't seem to affect cell growth. Um, we also uh, checked for pluripotency um, and through um, um, uh, graft formation. So, and then they all formed all three layers of the the, the germ layers, and so they they remain pluripotent. Okay, excellent. So not that we can see. Great. And there's one interesting question regarding the potential. Uh, so the genes that show a decrease in in uh, in, in expression, um, do they have a Tata motif, whereas the ones that do not have the is there any difference in the motif level? between the genes that do show expression differences versus the bulk of the genes that do not change in expression? Yeah, that's a good question. So it's about 20 to 30 genes, uh, depending on you know, the replicate or the assay. Um, and it's like, there's no consistency to them. Um, a couple of them have the Tata box, about 50% of them are non-coding. We don't know what they do really. They, they're, they seem to be random genes that we're not sure. We don't know how to study them much more than that because there's so few of them. Okay, cool. There are a couple of questions regarding the oxygen induced uh, TBP degradation. So one of them is, um, is it possible that uh, you have uh, de uh, de degradation of TBP is inefficient if you already have TBP that's bound to pol 2 sites. Okay, so you already have a pol 2 sites bound to the chromatin, and then you're degrading the ones that's maybe not bound to the chromatin yet, and that's why there is an apparent non-requirement for the gene. Great question. Um, and this is something that, um, I mean, it, it, it's an inherent question of the system, right? Because it's not a full knockout. And therefore, we cannot like rule out that there's a small amount that that is beyond the detection limit of our assays. I mean, we looked at both um, by protein, Western blots, by DNA binding assays, uh, 
site specific binding by cut and tag um, and even the IPMS, uh, right? So we, we think we have a handle that the TBP depletion is, is fairly um, robust enough. Um, now, I, not in this study, but a colleague from uh, my postdoctoral lab had also used these cells to quantify, um, uh, use a, a, an imaging method to have a quantification for the number of molecules per cell. So, uh, and they did this for TBP and they came out to about 100,000 molecules, give or take a few tens, 10,000 molecules, right? So let's say at maximum, like we have about 120,000 molecules. Um, and if we're depleting about 90%, which is the detection limit of our system, we, you know, beyond noise, beyond the, 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 the error of the system, we cannot go beyond that. So let's say 90%. So that leaves, uh, leaves us about with uh, 120, so that 12,000, <laughs> is that right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so like, let's say about 12,000. Okay, so let's say it's, it's a little less than 20, or a little less than 90%. Let's say it's 80%. So that's about 25,000 molecules or so. Um, and given that all genes are supposed to require um, TBP, including Pol1 and Pol3 genes, right? Now you're looking at all transcription start sites, which in our, in our database is numbering on the 30,000, at least for the Pol2 genes, about 60 to 70% of them are, um, are detectably active not to mention all three genes, Pol1 genes, enhancer, you know, all the regions that are transcribed by Pol2. We're really looking at the barest minimum that TBP could have. At, at the very least, um, we think that our system is sufficiently robust that it's, it's not enough TBP molecules to cover one molecule for each one that's active. It's a long-winded answer, but I, I understand that this is um, a, a major concern for these the implications of these results. It was a great answer that I answered multiple questions. Okay, so uh, that was that was great. Thank you very much. Um, Natalie Berube is asking if um, the TBP knockout cells have differential expression or TRF one. Uh, the TBP so. We did. Um, we actually measured uh, TRF1, um, and there was no change in its expression because we, we have the data, the, the Pol2 cut and tag and the NetSeq data with and without TBP depletion, and we see no effect. In fact, we even looked at it when TRF2 is knocked out, and it, there's also uh, no change in TRF1 expression. So we really don't think that it's there. Yeah, awesome. And um, some people in the audience are asking whether there is a possibility that you, the effects you're observing are ES specific, or do you think they apply to multiple cell types? Yes, uh, great question. Um, we are actually uh, proposing to have a follow-up study on this to differentiate our Degron TBP mouse ES cells, um, and then basically do these, these same exact experiments on, uh, we're, we're hoping to do it on neuroprogenitor cells. And then the, the nice part is that, you know, ES cells can do this and then we can generate new cell types and then try and test it from there. Um, the short answer is we don't know. Um, and we suspect that it might be ES cell specific um, if only because maybe the chromatin context of ES cells which is pretty unique to ES cells compared to other cell types. Um, maybe that's one also mechanism that it facilitates for, uh, you know, the lack of requirement for TBP. But we don't know. Very, very interesting. I think we have time for one more question. So it's a very, it's a very interesting question. Okay. So, what, what do you think the mechanism of uh, for the uh, assembly of the polymerase complex is without TBP? Yes. Great question. So um, 
I mean, the, high, the, the classical mechanism is that um, the assembly occurs in like a hierarchical fashion, right? TF2D comes first with TVP, then the next two, then Paul two, then the next two. Because we see that TF2D still binds to, T to, to DNA, uh, even when TBP is depleted, we think that this recruitment could still occur uh, in a similarly hierarchical fashion, even when TBP is depleted. Um, how long that would last, uh, you know, how many rounds of transcription it could sustain without TBP there, we, we're not sure and we can't measure because we can't do much longer than the, the system that we're, we're, you know, we're doing is cells die. Um, but we think it's it, it could still be forming hierarchically. Very cool. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much, uh, Sheila, for, for these beautiful talks. The audience was obviously very, very engaged uh, with lots and lots of questions. So I uh, think everybody really appreciated your, uh, your, your story and your data. And thank you, Rachel, as well. You did a fantastic job today. Thank you so much. Okay? It, was, uh, it was really an honor to have you guys present here uh, uh, today. Thank you. Thank and, you. And uh, you know, it was also another sign of how engaged the Canadian epigenetics community, but not just Canadian, international community is. Uh, we had over 140 um, individuals today attending this, uh, these, seminars, uh, these seminars. So thank you so much to everybody for attending. Um, as you, uh, just a reminder that we switched to a bi-monthly um, uh, frequency for our seminar series instead of monthly. Um, so our next seminar is going to be in April, um, and the speaker will be Dr. Peter Sterling from BC Cancer UBC. Uh, so please stay tuned for uh, uh, e reminder emails and for uh, social media reminders of uh, the next talk. Okay? So thank you everybody again for attending today, and thanks to our speakers, and thanks to Activative uh, for uh, hosting our, um, our seminar series. Have a good weekend, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone.